right about 34 to 38 years after the death of Jesus Christ. John writes this narrative. The book of John is so theologically loaded. And let me explain. The Apostle John is the only biblical author that puts Jesus Christ himself as appearing in the Old Testament. Hence, John 1, 1 through 2, that states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was God in the beginning. Now that's remarkable. Because John is putting Jesus as God. Which ultimately got Jesus of Nazareth murdered and killed himself for such a claim. Now, the noun term word is translated from the Greek term logos or logos, which simply means reason or thought with two aspects, cause and presence. According to John, Jesus was the very embodiment of reason and thought, a concept so complex yet so powerful that he could speak things and they literally exist. Amen. To sum it up, John believed that Jesus, the word in and of himself was indeed God. Amen. Now there are a lot of other events in this book that leads up to the main text of John 15 today and let me just share briefly with those. The book of John records the first miracle at Cana, where Jesus miraculously turns water into wine. The raising of a friend of Jesus named Lazarus from the dead, which was a depiction or a practical example of the very death and resurrection that Jesus himself would later experience. John records Jesus' appearance to the disciples three times after he resurrected. The doubting of Thomas who needed proof that Jesus was indeed alive by seeing the prints of his hands and the nails in his hands. Peter, the disciples' fishing adventure, a breakfast of fish and bread prepared by Jesus, all leading up to John 21 chapter. And if I could just read to you verse 1, chapter 21, this establishes exactly where we are that's leading up to the main text. After Jesus had performed miraculous signs according to John, after the doubting of Thomas, uh, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is also the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Peter decides that he wants to go fishing. So the disciples go out onto the lake and they are fishing. My translation says that Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that that was actually Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you don't have any fish do you? They replied, no. He told them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they threw their net and were not able to pull it in because there was a large amount of then the disciples who Jesus loved said, which is John, it is the Lord. So Simon Peter, when he heard that it was the Lord, tucked in his outer garment and plunged into the sea. Meanwhile, the other disciples came with the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for that they were not far from the land, only about 100 yards, about the length of a football field from Jesus. And when they got out, they, they began the breakfast, and Jesus is cooking the fish for them. And this is where we begin here, where Jesus began to ask these questions. Now, there were three important questions that Jesus asked. Seemingly the same question, but they all had different responses that Jesus was looking for. First, Jesus said, feed my lambs. Lambs representing believers in the church who are in the truth who are young, who need more teaching and understanding. 
Jesus also tells Peter, shepherd my sheep. And shepherding is simply the action of leading, guiding, directing, protecting, feeding, and disciplining believers to maturity from lamb to sheep. Come on, baby. And Jesus finally said, feed my sheep, which is the totality of the church into from, from lamb to sheep into the mature Christian. Thank you. And conclusively, we can conclude that Jesus was trying to get Peter to shepherd the collectivistic nature of all believers as one human. But here's the problem, church. Today, we're in a time in the age of the church where wolves disguised as pastors are selling motivation instead of salvation. Come on, my lamb. We're in the time in the church age where money is coveted and more desired as a priority and heaven is only viewed as a secondary option. We're in the time in the age of the church where members are solicited as customers. Pastors are revered as CEOs, and Jesus is the product that's for sale on the shelf because of the love of money. And all Jesus wants is for his true biblical shepherds. It's just to Peter, feed my sheep. Come on, my Lord. Peter seems to get what Jesus was telling him because in 1 Peter, the very epistle that he writes, he tells church leaders and elders how they should govern themselves as leaders in the church. And I quote, Peter says, give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you. Exercising oversight not merely as a duty, but willingly under God's direction, not for shameful profit, but eagerly. And do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be the examples to the flock. Then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. That tells me that a shepherd's motive as a pastor is to receive, number one, the crown of glory. Not to receive the glory of men. Amen. By living what he preaches on Sunday without feeling obligated for money, not according to his own will, understanding, and direction, not treating their people as possessions because they belong to God. This is called shepherd's care. This is shepherd's care is a form of biblical health care. And because a true shepherd loves Jesus, he can feed, love, and care for the flock of God. This is the kind of care that Blue Cross and Blue Shield can't cover. This is the kind of care that AARP don't have enough discounts to give for this kind of care. And the question is, folks, what is the food? What is Jesus trying to tell Peter to feed the flock, his sheep? When Jesus is tempted in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Satan tells Jesus because Jesus was hungry, according to the biblical author. He tells him to turn a stone into bread if he's hungry. Jesus responds to Satan by quoting scripture. And I know people call you holier than thou because you like to quote scripture. But if you are a follower of Jesus, the only thing that prevents Satan from prevailing in your life is the word of God. Jesus doesn't seek the philosopher of that day for the answer. Jesus looks to the word of God because he quote to Satan, Deuteronomy 8 and 3, and says that man shall not live by bread, bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the bread Amen. that Jesus is telling Peter, feed my flock. Peter, shepherd, my lambs. Peter, feed my sheep. Yes. What greater example to share with you today than your very own pastor? Come on. All right. Come on now. Amen. Right here in the great town of Robinson. <laughs> right. The 
last time I came to Robinsonville, oh, that was in 1993. I was in middle school. We played against Robinsonville Redskins. Yeah, Redskin helmets. Huh?
Can you just look in Psalm 23 and see your pastor? The great shepherd, Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. That tells me that God is sufficient. Amen. He takes me to lush pastures. He leads me to refreshing water. That means God is a leader. Right. Yes. He restores my strength. He leads me down on the right path. That means God is a restorer. Yes. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, some of you may be used to when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no danger because I know God is with me. That means his presence is always there. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm going to, no matter the threat, that means God is with me. Yay. Yeah. So that makes me trust him. Come on now. I will fear no danger. Your rod and your staff, it reassures me. You prepare a feast before me in the sight of my enemies. You refresh my head with oil. My cup is completely full. And because of it, surely your goodness and faithfulness will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the Lord's house for the rest of my life. Anybody want to live in the Lord's house for the rest of your life? Because I know you're in the Lord's house. I got the potential. I'm not worried about anything bothering me and threatening me anymore because I know that God is true to bring me. He's within my reach. Yes, he is. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord is my shepherd. Yes. I lack nothing. It doesn't matter what you're going through in your life. You have to remember to eat off the word of God. And get your reassurance and get your confidence that when God says something, that's exactly what it means. Right. Amen. And his word shall not return to him. Void. Void. Amen. Jesus tells Peter, feed my father. But well, my shepherd, the shepherd sheep relationship, which we see throughout the Bible, there's a reason why there's something about God that he likes about shepherds. The first king of Israel was a shepherd like Saul. Yes, yes he was. The next great king of Israel, who would eventually be pulled thrown in the model of Jesus as being the seed of David, the seed of Jesse. King David himself was a shepherd. It's something about shepherds that God sees in them. The natural talent that God has instilled in them from birth. Naturally preparing them for ultimately using what he not, what they naturally thrive in in order for his glory. Yes. Sheep alone are vulnerable. Sheep alone is hard for them to protect themselves. They don't make good decisions and choices, and they oftentimes thrive when they're in a pack together. So hitch your shepherd is the person that comes along and protects the sheep. Your shepherd is the one that comes along with his staff and guides them. Your shepherd is the one that shear them to ensure in the summertime they don't overheat and become weighted with their fur. That's a shepherd's care. And this is why I believe God loves shepherds. And why symbol, symbolically the church is his sheep. And symbolically the pastor is his other shepherd. And then the oil that shepherds use on their sheep. It protects them. It protects the animal. It protects other insects from burying in their ears and ultimately selling in their membranes to prevent them from becoming hysterical. This is why they anoint their head with oil. Sheep, sheep have a habit of butting each other, harming each other with their heads. They, they put the oil up there to soothe them. And they make it slick on purpose to prevent them from injuring each other. Come on. Come on now. 
That's what the purpose of a shepherd. All right. Lead, guide, protect, feed, discipline. And this is exactly what you have. Yes. Right here. Yes. In Robinsonville. Yes.